guys so much for coming to um, our panel about stolen children in A Song of Ice and Fire and the myth and folklore roots of that motif. Um, we know that we're competing with the spotlight on the Game of Thrones actors, so you could have been so many other cool places, but you chose to be with us, so thank you very much. Um, I think we'll, we'll uh, introduce ourselves first. Hi, me. I'm Mary, Maester Mary on Twitter, up from under Winterfell on YouTube. I'm dressed as good queen, queen Alisane, so if you want to come chat with me today about how to improve women's lives in Westeros, <laughs> um, I'm holding court all day. <laughs> yes, that's what we like to hear. Um, I'm Lauren. I'm known as Shakes of Thrones on Twitter. You can find me there and also at my blog, ShakespeareOfThrones.com, where I write analytical essays about Shakespeare and A Song of Ice and Fire. And I also have a YouTube channel, Shakespeare of Thrones. So, yes, I am various places on the internet. <laughs> Ross Miller, uh, Blue Blood on Twitter. Uh, give me a follow there if you're uh, interested in seeing the things I have to say. I'll uh, post an essay every now and then. You can find out about it there. Um, uh, my name is Nessie. I'm Question Beast or One Question Beast on Twitter. Uh, and you'll find me there talking about all kinds of weird and wonderful things that um, may or may not be true. I love tinfoil. Please come tinfoil with me. It's, <laughs> like my, it's my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> great. We might we might even get into some tinfoil in this panel. Who knows? Um, okay, great. So yeah, we're going to be talking about the stolen child motif in A Song of Ice and Fire. Children who have been taken away, children who are abandoned and given up, and also children who have had their childhoods ruined, honestly, because I think that the motif of the stolen child serves to underscore that loss of innocence as well. Um, but we're going to be talking about a, a couple of broad topics. We're going to talk about the changeling child first and uh, talk about different instances of the changeling child that we see in A Song of Ice and Fire and its myth and folklore roots. And um, then we're going to be talking about other instances of the ch stolen child and a song of ice and fire. And then at the end, we're going to wrap up and talk about the meaning of why we see so many children in this stolen child um, position and then open it up for questions. So if it sounds good to you guys, I think I'll open it up with talking about the changeling child. All right, cool. So the changeling child. It's a um, figure commonly present in European folklore and myth, and it's basically rooted in the idea that fairies took human children and replaced them with fairy ones. It was often used as an explanation for why a child was sick or disabled. Um, and there's, there's a quote from this book called Ghosts and Fairies, which was published in 1973 by Thomas Keith, which goes, the risk of being landed with a fairy changeling similarly reminded men of the need to look after a newborn child very carefully. A moment's neglect might be reward, rewarded by the substitution of a fairy child. And we definitely see changeling children in myth and literature and folklore and also Shakespeare um, in A Midsummer Night's Dream where there's this whole conflict in the supernatural realm that centers on uh, Titania stealing a, a, a human child and taking it into the fairy realm and Oberon is upset at her and all the attention that she's paying this child and shenanigans ensue. And um, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later, but first we might want to start by talking about characters in A Song of Ice and Fire and how they are loosely based on this idea of the changeling child. So, Ross, did you want to start? Uh, sure. <coughs> I'll start. I want to talk about uh, John, first of all. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to the changeling child. Uh, some of the, uh, the darker aspects of it is that the changeling child myth was used to justify getting rid of children sometimes that you couldn't afford to support. A lot of you know, peasants fell on hard times. You don't have the food to take care of your child. Uh, a way to rationalize what you had to do was to say, this isn't really my child. You know, an elf came and swapped it out, obviously. So 
the world will be fine. Great just excuse, rid solid. Of that one. <laughs> right. Rock solid logic. And you see a lot of that with John, is John Snow is obviously the unwanted child, uh, especially when it comes to Catelyn. And I think that the fact that John thinks specifically that Cat looked at him like she begrudged him every bite of food, almost made him feel guilty for you know, taking up the Stark's resources, I think that's a nod to the changeling mythology. Uh, Catelyn's all constantly trying to get rid of him, and then she does kind of manage to get rid of him. And the way that she does that is that she advocates to Ned to send him off to the Night's Watch, which is kind of like being whisked away to, you know, to other world. That's kind of where, you know, obviously the others, capital O, others, the, the bad guys live up in the icy north, uh, but capital O, other world, is something that you see in mythology a lot. It's the land of the fairy, mm -hmm. the land of the elves, yep. and she whisked Jon Snow away. And I think there's even a nod to uh, the famous story Rumpelstiltskin there, and uh, we can talk more about that later. But mm -hmm. obviously on the Rumpelstiltskin story, uh, the uh, queen, or the soon-to-be queen after she gets married, uh, makes a wish for an imp to come and spin straw into gold. And in exchange, she gives the imp her you know, firstborn son to whisk away. Uh, obviously, she stops that from happening. But I don't think it's a coincidence that after you know, John gets whisked away to the end of the world, that it is you know, the imp in the story, Tyrion, that escorts him up to the wall to get him out of the Catelyn's mm -hmm. way. Okay. I think now might be a great time to talk a little bit about Arya. Um, one of my, one of the only references to Snarks and Grumpkins in the book in terms of actual story actually comes in A Game of Thrones in Sansa's very first chapter. So once when she was littler, Sansa had even asked Mother if perhaps there hadn't been some mistake. Perhaps the Grumpkins had stolen her real sister. But Mother had only laughed and said no. Arya was her daughter and Sansa's trueborn sister, blood of their blood. So what I think is great about this as an example is it's casting Arya as an unwanted child. And remember, both Arya and Jon are, are feel like the outcasts of the Stark family. That's part of what their bond is. So you have Arya, who's being associated with Snarks and Grumpkins, and then John, who goes up to the wall to fight Snarks and Grumpkins, mm -hmm. um, which weaves in the, the stolen child mythology to the way we understand children as outcasts. Right, and they're not just outcasts because of the way that they look or um, any, anything ab about how their appearance is, but how they act. And I, I think that that's really interesting. Time and again, in A Song of Ice and Fire, we have this outcast sibling, this sibling who just does not belong. And we, we see that with Tyrion as well. You know, He thinks that if he had been born to a peasant family, he would have been killed. And um, you know, it's this old law that cripples, bastards, and broken things are done away with quickly because they, they might cause problems to a family who doesn't make as much money as like the Lannisters. Um, so we definitely see that with, with Tyrion as well. And then, and then we have Shireen too, who... And what's really interesting with Shireen is we'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit about some of the more specific mythological nods that have to do with Shireen. But she is, because she's touched by grayscale, she is a literal changeling child because grayscale is kind of the equivalent magical taint, right, mm -hmm. that you would have um, that would turn you into a fairy. And beyond the wall in the north, Val um, complains about Shireen being alive because if she were born in a wildling family, they would have exposed her, exposed her and left her out to die. Um, mm -hmm. And when later when we talk about Shireen's sacrifice, it becomes really interesting to see how she is also set up as a magical changeling child because of the grayscale affliction. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so also you don't have to be like the unwanted or the outcast child to catch the eye of the fairies because sometimes in mythology the fairies choose um, to take children for their beauty or in the mm -hmm. cost of when you're making a bargain with the fae they take the child that they wish. They take the eldest. <coughs> they request the eldest child, firstborn child. It's generally a cost. 
is to pay for college with you have to deal with the parent. They want or they may want the youngest child, the babe, the one at the breast. <clears throat> There's also the child that is the most interesting, to be an interesting child, different. You catch the eye of the parent. Or the most beautiful, like the beautiful child, which would be Samson. The wicked witch wants the most beautiful child to take away from you. So there's many ways that you can catch the eye of the fairy or the monster in the story and be taken away. And these are all indicative of all of these dark children because they're all taken and stolen away by one of these, for one of these reasons. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we have, of course, Craster's sons who are given, given away. away to the others. And um, that's definitely definitely another example of the changeling child like not present in the family but the but the giving away of a human child to the supernatural realm and um, that, that's going to bring me back to a midsummer night's dream so that I can um, so that we can look at the literary function of the changeling child and children who are given away to the supernatural realm or who spend time there um, as I mentioned uh, to Tanya and Oberon or Oberon not Oberon, like A Song of Ice and Fire. I get them mixed up all the time now. Oberon. Um, <laughs> right. Um, they're fighting over this abduction of a, of a human child, and Oberon plays tricks on t Titania, making her fall in love with an S to teach her a lesson um, about her foolish desires. And yeah, okay, you know, fr from a certain angle, this is kind of weird and um, problematic because a lot of the essence of this play is about the reconciliation of female desire and the patriarchy, we're, we're not gonna go there right now, but um, I, I, the, the changeling child is really interesting in its literary function because scholars have interpreted, interpreted it as representing the instability of life and innocence, which is caught in the fight of reason versus passion. And I find that really interesting because reason versus passion is a conflicting duality that we see quite often in A Song of Ice and Fire, which is all about lots of conflicting dualities. I mean, Ice and Fire, it's in the title. So um, I, I, I think that definitely all these children who are unwanted, who are um, given away, who are swapped, who are um, you know taken and and, and, and also who, who are lied to as, as they grow up. Um, I, I think that that really says something about innocence in A Song of Ice and Fire, especially this being the fantasy genre, which is generally directed towards children, um, not this particular epic work, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe it's not a story that your, your own children read. But um, I, I, I do think that children have such a presence in this work and this innocence lost is, is, is so resonant throughout the story and um, yeah, it, it's just really interesting to analyze it from, from this perspective. So with that in mind, Mary, you wanted to talk more about Shireen. Yeah, so one of the things that's most gut-wrenching in the show that hasn't happened in the books yet is Shireen's sacrifice. And I think it's one of the most obvious literary illusions in the book. Um, at the beginning of the Iliad, there is a sacrifice of, uh, if I can never say this right, Iphigenia. Um, Iphigenia. Okay, we're okay, gonna call her. Name. We're gonna call her Iffy. Iffy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poor um, Iffy. So Agamemnon, that I can say. Um, sacrifices. Uh, Did you say Stagamemnon? <laughs> Stagamemnon. Stagamemnon. <laughs> he, That's canon name. I like it. I like it good. So Stagamemnon sacrifices Iffy in order to get favorable weather from the gods because he's done something to offend the gods. And this is an obvious parallel to Stannis's relationship with R'hllor. So, okay, by itself that doesn't seem all that interesting. But when you take it with this theme of children as innocence and children as sacrifice, it becomes very important for understanding one of the moral themes of A Song of Ice and Fire, and that is, newsflash, child sacrifice is bad. <laughs> um, but historically, th this is actually a moral problem that humanity has, has dealt with. 
at the time of the Iliad, the idea of sacrificing children to the gods was, was seen as a very prized sacrifice. Because if you're giving up something innocent, then you'll get something in return. Um, and there are still, to this day, you know, caves in Mayan society that are being found that have the bones of sacrificed children. Um, so why is that a big deal in terms of understanding A Song of Ice and Fire? Well, a lot of people think that even in the Old Testament, there is a rejection of this pagan idea of child sacrifice in favor of a new bargain with God. And, and wh how is that symbolized? Well, when, Abra when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, you have God intervening and staying his hand, which is meant to symbolize, hey, you're not supposed to sacrifice this child. Um, so let's take a step back to A Song of Ice and Fire and consider Jon Snow's baby swap um, of Craster's child and Gilly's child, which is meant to save a child from the flames. So we can see this tension between sacrificing children and protecting innocence. And obviously John is also the protected child as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even more stark relief with Shireen because Shireen is the changeling magical touched child that mm -hmm. even the wildlings view as, as tainted. Um, and I think that's a really important context for understanding yeah, that, that, sh that magical touch isn't always a good thing. In right. Shireen's case, that's a bad thing. Oh, um, but she's the sweetest baby. She's, she's baby. I know. She's so innocent. She's the most innocent of all the innocents. I, I think a, a point mm -hmm. Mary made earlier comparing John trying to uh, save uh, uh, Mansa's son by doing the baby swap, comparing that to Abraham not sacrificing uh, his son. I've not heard that particular comparison mm. before, but I like it. Uh, I do think that there is a lot of significance in John not sacrificing the baby and doing going out of his way to try and save it. Uh, in that, as the uh, as good and evil in a song of ice and fire start to uh, fight more and more, the good side they start to it gets harder to tell who is who. The the good guys uh, start to look more and more like the villains. And a place that's really clear is on this theme of changelings and child sacrifice, because what do the others do? They go and they collect babies and they do something to them. I don't know if they touch them on the forehead like they do on the TV show, but they somehow transfigure uh, infants into more others to fight. And you start to see, you know, what's the Night Watch do? They round up all the unwanted children from around the realm mm -hmm. and turn them into fighting machines to, you know, try and do something good, but they're obviously <coughs> resembling the others themselves in an important way. Mm -hmm. And then you see John, you know, sending the baby away instead of using it as a sacrifice to fight the others. He's, uh, I don't know, breaking the wheel, mm -hmm. I guess, is what you would say. He's trying to break the cycle and uh, get everybody on a better track. There's mm -hmm. a good quote from, from the ending of the show where John says, the world we need is a world of mercy. And <coughs> John represents mercy instead of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes directly back to Ned and his desire for a world of mercy. Or, um, you know, his, he, Ned was the one who showed us how important children's lives are. I mean, he, he was the one who protected John, who took him from Liana and raised him under, um, the identity that he is, and I mean, I mean, it's almost kind of like, it, it's almost like Ned in the position of, you know, Oberon taking the human, or, or Titania actually, <laughs> taking John, the, um, this child, back to his realm where he doesn't belong and raising him there, and then Catalan is almost in the position of Oberon and getting really jealous at, at Ned for that, but, but Ned is like protecting the child because of his close relationship with Liana and his desire not to um, see any more violence against children. And we have this constant um, question of what is a child's life against the lives of millions. And Stannis struggles with that as well. And I, I, I think that it's, it's interesting how this motif interlocks with character conflicts throughout the story and uh, the greater themes that we see. But 
Uh, moving on to our second topic, I, I think we've already done that a little bit, talking about other instances of the stolen child in, in folklore and in A Song of Ice and Fire. Nessie, I think you had some, some things to say mm. about that. Yes, well, one of the interesting things that I noticed was we have these figures who are traveling throughout the kingdom, gathering children. We have, <coughs> yes, you've lost my cow. We have Yarn, who is a, if you just go by how he looks, he is a hunchback foul mouth, dressed in black, not very pleasant looking man who is going from north to south, south to north, gathering all of the bad children um, to take them north. So he, <clears throat> in my mind, of course, we think he's like a monstrous figure with a good purpose. Mm -hmm. He's trying to save these children, but yet do they really want to go with him? No, do they have real choice? No, because basically they're the dregs of Flea Bottom and have nowhere else. No one wants them. Mm -hmm. They are the most unwanted children in King's Landing. We know of them. It's like petty theft just to survive. So they get to travel, yay, north to the wall where they give up nothing but their entire lives to serve the realm that never wanted them. So Yorin is in my mind like a Krampus figure who comes and takes the naughty children away to the land of winter mm -hmm. or the underworld to live in this creepy ass cave. <laughs> So yay, Krampus is in there. Also we have, oh, our friend Jamie Lannister, who once, of course, the Riverlands have been subdued after the War of the Five Kings, is tasked with, um, one, relieving uh, the siege of Huron. But on his way through uh, the Riverlands, he's gathering all the children as hostages from the River Lords that have uh, revolted from their crown. So he's gathering all of these children um, Sometimes it's the favorite child, sometimes it's the only child, sometimes it's uh, the not, want not wanted child in the case of um, Oster Pellet. Uh, no, Oster Pellet. Um, Blackwood, Oster Blackwood. He's one of my favorite guys, one of my favorite kids in A Song of Ice and Fire, Oster. I have all these brain stones, kid. Um, <laughs> Oster Blackwood, who is like not the favorite child, he's the gawky middle second, third son who's so bookish that his father's like, take him, take him, <laughs> not my little girl, take him. So yeah, Jamie is gathering all of these children to take to Casterly Rock, which is like this great cavernous underground system. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. So he's gonna take all these children to the underworld. Yeah, and you, well. were, you were thinking that there are some <coughs> Pied Piper similarities A similarity in there. the Pied Piper of Hamlin because what happened when, yeah, there was an actual event in the Pied Piper that was based on where after a huge war in um, the Germanic states, there was so much open land and there had been so many people that had been killed that the winners of the war wanted to resettle these areas. So they would go village to village and the Pied Piper, these were actual um, recruiters that were paid per person that they could take and they would move whole villages, like whole generations of young children or young, young adults were moved out of the villages to settle these lands that had been devastated by war. So that's where the legend of the Pied Piper comes from. He sings all these, makes all these promises, how this is gonna be so great, but actually he's just being paid to say these things and take your, you know, take these um, young adults, young children, 13, 14 year old people away that's where they never see their yeah. families again. Yeah, yeah. It's, Nessie, it's so interesting mm -hmm. in the context of the Night's Watch being baby stealers mm -hmm. because that, that puts the relationship between um, Craster yeah. and the Watch in a whole new perspective. You know, John is so outraged when he finds out that Craster's children are being sacrificed, but it's not a big deal to the Watch. You know, Mormont has known about it the whole time. And, in, you know, in the context of what you're saying about Yorin, it's not surprising at all because the Night's Watch There's have so probably much. always been baby stealers. Um, and Snarks and Grumpkins, Snarks too. And Grumpkins. Um, their association with Northern lore makes it e even, makes that feel like an even more strong connection yeah. to explore. Yeah, it's interesting how it's all connected within the story that we're reading, A Song of Ice and Fire, and how you can also find all these connections in uh, mythology and folklore, like the Pied Piper and yeah, in Hope. Midsummer Hansel Night's and Dream. Gretel. And Hansel and yeah. Gretel is a big one where yeah. you have these two unwanted children that the stepmother no longer wants. Hey, I'm sorry, cat. You did nothing wrong, but in this, you know, you did have to steal. 
Anyway, so this, the, you're giving the unwanted children to the monsters in the woods. You're leaving these unwanted children out, basically exposing them to the food and water. We can't feed them. Go into the woods. You're supposed to die. So, um, yes, they find their way, of course, to the monster who um, you know, acts in this case like they're, they're taking in the children. I say they're, they're fattening up the children so she can eat them. So many of these fairy tales, they're more like horror stories to me than uh, the kind of thing that you tell your child at night. And and there is so much horror in A Song of Ice and Fire, too. (laughs) Don't go in the woods because you will die. Yeah. Yeah. um, I I don't know if any of you listened to to Not a Cast and uh, Poor Quentin and and Brendan B. Fish, but one of the things that Poor Quentin says is that the, the essence of horror is not that there are monsters... Um, at our door, it's that we're going to let them in. And I think about that a lot with um, th- with the monsters that we see in A Song of Ice and Fire, and with the, the human ones and the non-human ones. So um, definitely pertinent to this topic as well, as we're connecting it to fairy tale and the monsters that we see in fairy tales. And um, speaking of fairy tales, Ross, you have some connections with Rumpelstiltskin that you wanted to talk about as well. Yes. All right. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, there seems to be an element of Rumpelstiltskin that you can spot in the subtext of A Song of Ice and Fire and that uh, the form it takes is you will see uh, a woman, I've probably talked about Catelyn, she's the, got the best example. You'll see a woman who will make a wish, pray to the gods for something, and then they will get their wish and they will lose a child for it. And you have to look carefully, but if you know what to look for, you can spot it. And the first example that you get is Catelyn. And very early in the story, she wants what she wants to happen is she wants to keep Bran in Winterfell. So when Ned and Catelyn are arguing about who's going to go to King's Landing, who's going to stay in Winterfell, and obviously John gets sent away to the Wall, and which is what she wants, she wants to keep Bran in Winterfell. And Ned wants to take him south to King's Landing. And Catelyn agrees to it then, but what we find out later, when Bran falls from the window and hurts himself, he winds up staying in Winterfell. And so Catelyn got her wish. And when she's crying over his body, John walks in. And she says to John then, I prayed for this. She, that's the, we don't see it happen, but she tells us about it afterwards. So Catelyn prayed to her gods to keep Bran in Winterfell. And she says the exact words, you know, sometimes prayers are answered. So Catelyn got her prayer, and she then turns to John and says the famous line, you know, it should have been you. Like she wanted to sacrifice John. She wanted to get rid of him, and she wanted to keep Bran. And that is what wound up happening in a way, not the way that she wanted. But, uh, yeah, and then you see, obviously, John head north with uh, Tyrion the imp. Uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but on the way north to the wall, there's a telling scene where... uh, I think Tyrion is uh, mocking John, saying something mean about the Night's Watch, and Ghost comes out of nowhere and tackles him. Mm-hmm. And Tyrion says, "Why did he attack me?" And John just kind of, as he's walking away, says, "Thought you were a grumpkin." <laughs> and Tyrion admits, "Oh, I guess I do kind of look like a grumpkin." <coughs> and then uh, I think Sansa compares him to a grumpkin a couple of times later. Uh, so we're definitely meant to associate those two things. Uh, but yeah, and then later on, uh, when Catelyn confronts. Jamie in the River Run prison cell, uh, she asks him why he did it, and she's trying to get Jamie to take responsibility for pushing Bran out the window, and he won't take responsibility for it. He actually tells Catelyn to blame the gods, and it's just one more, you know, it was, it was the gods' will and their, their hand intervening that sent Bran to the window that caused him to fall, because it's what Catelyn prayed for. You mean the old gods? Because that's who ended up with him eventually. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, and thinking about Bran in this context is really interesting, too, because it's, I mean, he's almost kind of a changeling, too. He might have he might have died, um, but he had this, this dream while he was, un, you know, unconscious in his, in his coma or whatever. And um, the three-eyed raven was, the uh, three-eyed crow was, was speaking to him as he was falling, and he was seeing all these visions. And I almost kind of think of that as, the supernatural realm claiming him as their child. You know, even though he wakes up and he's still in the human realm and everything, he is changed, um, and he he belongs to this 
otherworldly place. So I, I think of Bran as a kind of a changeling, too. Change. Uh, he might be the best. Yeah. He might be the prototypical example of the changeling child. If you view... Um, it, so, okay. One thing that's really interesting about changelings is the connection with warging. So both John and Arya, who are viewed as outcasts, are wargs, right? And obviously so is Bran. He's the most powerful warg in the story. Um, he also wargs into Hodor in this like very mm. dark kind of way. Um, so in, in one way, Bran is both a changeling and a body snatcher himself. Um, oh, wow. I never even thought that. That's good. And by being his mother's favorite, of course, he's going to be noticed by the fairies. Right. Well, and, and he is, if we think about the mythology behind Brandon Stark, you know, there's this tinfoil theory that seems like it's less and less tinfoil, that Brandon in the current timeline may have influenced all of the Brandon Starks throughout history, um, or that there's at least some connection between the magic of the Weirwoods and, mytho you know, mythological kind of figures like <coughs> Bran the Builder, um, which also ties... Bran into the supernatural world. Um, I mean, he's really the most fairy-like point of view character that we have. Yeah, and I know that George R. R. Martin has said that he has trouble writing Bran's POVs because he's so young and he's going through all this shit, you know, but um, I don't know. They, they really make sense to me, and I think it's because it is that magical POV, and it's what we see so often in um, typical fantasy stories directed towards youth is a child in that position with that sort of magical perspective. And I, I don't know, it, it works for me. And I like how Bran synthesizes the human and the supernatural realm, or is at least in the process of that in the books. And it's also why I just love that he becomes the king at the end, which it's, it's going to happen in the books, all right, you guys? It, it's going to happen. <laughs> and it's it, to me, it's like the triumph of the fallen child, the fallen innocence. It's it's like growth into something else. It's you you, you don't regain that. Like um, I don't know. To it's me, a stolen childhood too, which is one of the other topics that we have. Bran's childhood is absolutely stolen. When he mm -hmm. becomes Bran the Broken, his dreams of becoming a knight are stolen. Um, right. His dream of being Cat's child is stolen because his parents are taken from him, and instead he goes on this mythological journey. And what's the price of that? In in the show, it seems very obvious that it's losing his humanity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's absolutely the the stolen childhood kind of motif. In addition to this kind of magical transformation, it's also a loss of his, yeah, like you said, of his innocence. Right, for sure. So. I really like that he's king at the end because it just kind of brings everything full circle and we have this triumph of the child even after all of these children are stolen and grow up with horrible childhoods. It's, it, it's just really nice to me that Bran is, is king at the end. Um, so yeah, we, we've been kind of getting into our, our third topic which is stolen childhoods. We've already talked about that a little bit. Um, do you guys have any, any uh, Characters in particular that you wanted to talk about? Well, we have a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> for a minor, them? minor character All we haven't them. mentioned yet would be uh, Ario Hota. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a changeling child uh, references in, uh, in his storyline. Uh, as he mentioned, he's the the last born of as, is it six children, six or seven children. He's the last of a whole <laughs> lot of children, and he. Know, he obviously gets given away almost you know to the the bearded priest which are kind of operate the same way the night's watch does uh, only they're a little bit more religious and it seems like they actually seem to rule the city they live in so they hold political power but they they take the unwanted children and turn them into soldiers so they they're just like the nice wise and just like the others and uh, Ario Hota you know mentions that his you know he was given away because they mm -hmm. didn't have the resources to feed him and it seems like he was given away very young, mm -hmm. and uh, once that's done to him, uh, he, he so up. yeah, his and he turns him because he had such a heavy appetite. Right. Mm. And uh, so with Arya, he didn't get a proper childhood, and you can see that in his point of view chapters. Uh, people have referred to him as the you know the human camera. Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost like he just reports exactly what he sees and has no feelings about it. Everyone he meets, mm -hmm. he's thinking about how he can kill them and how the fight will go. 
uh, he's almost robotic. He's just a Terminator. Mm -hmm. It's you know he's yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to see how these traumatic childhoods inform your adulthood and and the kind of person that you become. And everybody becomes. Everybody is different. Everybody experiences, internalizes these experiences differently. So, yeah, that's definitely um, how Ariel Hota is affected. Um, a character that I think of when I... So, sorry, Nessie, did you want to chime in? Well, with I was just going to play off of this because there's also the Red Hood of Zorro mm -hmm. and Thoris of Mir and also Melisandre are both children that were given away, stolen. Mm. Slaved, sold mm. to the Red Sandra, Temple, yeah. who have the entire life devoted to the Red Temple, whether they want to or not. And then, of course, as they reach adulthood, they are, in, in essence, repeating these same patterns by Queen Melisandre trying to, <coughs> excuse me, taking children for sacrifice and burning, and Thoros gathering these other unwanted young men, boys, Riverlanders, uh, and the Brotherhood of the Five Banners living in their little underground cave systems. So he's taking in all of these other unwanted children. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so right. it is a pattern that repeats in some ex in, in childhood then through adulthood. Right. Um, a <coughs> character that um, we, we haven't mentioned yet who has had a terrible childhood is Daenerys. I mean, she's a child when we meet her in A Song of Ice and Fire. She's only 13. And um, she's being wedded to Drogo and pregnant at 14 and then experiences the, you know, horrible things at the end of A Game of Thrones, Drogo's death and the miscarriage of her child, which you could also analyze that from a change lane perspective too, you know, giving um, what, what life must pay for death, uh, death, death must pay for life, which well, goes both ways. Yeah. Magic. Right, right. And um, gosh, you know, she just doesn't have the most she doesn't have the best mentors around her either. <laughs> when you <laughs> look at her supporting cast, I mean, she's got her violence RPG and team sucks. yeah, yeah, it really does. I mean, honestly, Mary Mazdor is one of the <laughs> better ones, and she's still <laughs> extremely <laughs> violent. <laughs> and um, I, I think that Daenerys, we, we, even though, uh, even I have a tendency to like want to age her up when I'm reading, just because it is hard. so hard and painful to read this and think of a 13 year old, but it's also really important to her character growth and her um, and, and her arc, knowing that she's not a, a fully formed adult in she's her brain yet as she's experiencing all of this and she's internalizing it. And it's not just going to be her actions that um, foreshadow what's, what's going to happen in the books to come and you know, King's Landing, which she'll probably eventually burn a little bit similar to how she did in the show, maybe with a different path leading to it and um, different context. But I, we're, I think we're supposed to consider that that uh, ruined childhood, that that trauma that she experienced early on, and how that's shaped her, how that shapes her into a semi-adult. I don't even think she's going. She, she's going to be like 16 by the <laughs> end of the series, so she's mm -hmm. not even at adulthood yet. Yep, married at 13, widowed at 14. Mm -hmm. And Georgia. Gone now. He's doing something where he is uh, criticizing the, uh, <coughs> the way that people do things, where they give up these kids to, uh, <coughs> you know, to make peace. Uh, another form that I think this takes is uh, children that die in, uh, in order to end a war. Mm. And uh, Daenerys would be that. Her and Viserys, obviously, they got away, but they were exiled. And you know, the peace at the end of uh, Robert's Rebellion was built on their suffering. And you know, Daenerys is going to come back, and she's going to play a role in burning down King's Landing. And I think George is saying, you know, does peace at the cost of these children, is it really doing anything mm -hmm. good? And he repeats that a few other times, like with Theon. Theon mm -hmm. gets snatched away in order to yeah. uh, bring peace at, uh, to the end of uh, Balon's Rebellion. And what's he do? He comes back to Winterfell, and he doesn't burn it, but he definitely plays a role. He sacks it, and then it gets burned as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And so... He's criticizing the Miller son. Yeah, right, Ned and, and Robert and their way of doing things and you know, stealing kids to make peace is that these kids come back and then they burn your house down. And maybe we should stop abusing kids to you know, end these wars this way. Mm -hmm. 
think one of the things that's really interesting about Theon is his identity conflict between being a Stark and a Greyjoy. You know, you see that in the show and you see it in, in the books where part of the aspect of him being a, a changeling is his own identity being unfixed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because he also visits trauma upon Bran and Rickon. Um, I mean, he because he expels them from their home, doesn't actually kill them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really interesting example of the abused or the victim then becoming a perpetrator of violence. Right. Um, and I think it, an interesting question will be how will that cycle of trading kids um, to end wars be broken? And if Bran forgives Theon like he does in the show, and Theon ends up having this kind of heroic defense of Bran due to Bran's mercy for Theon. I think that's a very powerful example right. of breaking the, the cycle of the stolen child. Yeah, especially considering that Bran was the one, like, I don't know, his <coughs> being pushed out the window, it feels like the original sin of the series as, uh, that as we know it, as we're reading it, and then he's the one to grant that mercy. It's yeah. very powerful. Question. Yeah, yeah. I yes. think I think we're at question That's time. Two minutes now. Yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Um, I guess this is not really a good question, but I may ask one. Well, you know all of us, so you can ask us later. <laughs> I think one example is how he will have the victims become the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Like I think he is, and, and I think for mm -hmm. example, if Theon ends up being redeemed, I think that will be a, a little bit of an inversion of the, of the changeling child. Um, it, the same thing with John ending up giving mercy for, for Mance's son in the baby swap as being playing out the same thing that happened with Lyanna, um, I think that's another example of him, him kind of playing with the trope because it's, he is intermixing the themes of mercy and the themes of vengeance into the, the kind of stolen child mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's just more of a really deep exploration of all the problems that, that come with um, the stolen child and and the changeling child and um, giving a life for another and uh, all that innocence lost. I mean, we, we I don't know. I, I just don't even know if fairy tales go to <laughs> they they don't go into as great depth as this work does. I mean, how many how many pages is it? it's like a million pages or something like that. So of course we're going to get a lot more depth and. Right, right. Of course, we're going to get a lot more more depth and exploration of these themes, and I, I think that a lot of it is um, directed towards adults. Uh, of course, we're adults uh, who are reading this series, and um, the lessons that we're supposed to think about, or the questions that we're supposed to think about, is yeah, what what is worth? It, how how much is is. Uh, is war worth the cost of it? I think that's what it really comes down to. And it's not just a one answer question. There, there is so much depth there. And that's what I think the beauty of this series is, is that we can have so many questions and so many different answers, depending on the context. Yeah, that's really interesting to, to think about Varys in, in that context, too. I mean, gosh, you could just you talk about every single character. Child. I know, yeah. I know. He and he steals all the little children of Westeros. And, and he was in the, the right. mummer's troop so, uh, as a child, and it's almost like they're kind of in that position of the, the, the supernatural realm, like claiming the timid child, and then 
Um, and then and then him and his little birds and too. Then, yeah. So and allegedly that's doing a baby swap. Well, that's him visiting the trauma that was visited on him. Mm -hmm. trauma, yeah, yeah, he was a stolen child. Now mm -hmm. he's stealing, stealing other children. children. He was cut. Like now he's cutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. We all have that moment when we when we kind of grow up, and usually it's something that's very impactful, perhaps traumatic, and we see that all over the place in these this series. Um, yes. Oh, he yeah. Literally yes. I, I, yeah, I, I was oh, actually yeah, thinking about that. We, we we did talk about Yeah, we we did <laughs> talk about that one quote from from Sansa about her possibly being stolen from the Grumpkins yes, and, and, and everything, but we didn't even talk about her going forward in in her arc and Mhm. Mm right, she's a child soldier. So one thing that's interesting is she almost steals herself because Arya has some agency mm -hmm. in her decision to go to the faceless men. Now she doesn't have agency in the way that she's, I mean, it's like, I, I think you can, you can look at, um, I, I think what's interesting is that her story is, is complicated, right? Um, she's driven from her home and like all the Stark children become stolen children. Um, and the association of, uh, like I said, Bran and Arya and John with warging is also interesting because that magical connection also emphasizes this idea that, mm -hmm. you know, when your childhood is stolen, um, there's this kind of like magical <laughs> replacement in there. Here's a nice puppy. Yeah, yeah here's, <laughs> a nice, here's a nice puppy. It might steal your soul. Okay, one more question. I think so. Possibly the other example is to bring in the Blackfire connection, the, the piss water prince, yes. right? So you have the, this <coughs> this mystery over whether or not, you know, the Aegon is actually Aegon. And I think what's delightful about that mm. is here's George yeah. throwing another wrench in there where there's a, a fake baby swap. Um, right. that, that ties in with all the baby swapping. Mm -hmm. you see it's not just baby swapping, but child swapping. Or one for a life for a life. Yeah, it's that idea of cost, right? Cost. And George loves to make us wrestle with every action, even a good action, having a complicated consequence. Um, and and that's the, like one of the things I think might happen in the Winds of Winter, right? Is sure, we took uh, Mansa's baby right, away from the wall, but what's gonna happen yeah, to Gilly's baby, baby? I know, what's gonna happen to Gilly's baby? Well, <laughs> and a monster, no, there's a great example of a change monster in child name, a child monster. named Monster. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> right. Ding, 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 right on Okay, I, we have one more minute. I saw a question back here, yes, please. Goodness. I so tend to think so. Yeah, there's that. Uh, somebody pointed out that one of the castles on the on the wall is called Snowgate, you know, capital S. Oh, yeah. And then there's the you know the uh, was it the the Black Gate Black where you, know, you literally you know, you, sacrificial you, gate. You get fed to the north, and yeah, I think yeah. that there was probably a, a yeah, need the, the, for some the, child the, sacrifices. Right. The first rites probably did create would have created a lot of highborn bastards, which would have been unwanted children, which would have been great candidates to send to the Night's Watch to keep them mm -hmm. well manned. You know, we know in the by the time the story rolls around, there's not very many Night's Watchmen left. There used to be a lot more. Uh, maybe the fact that the first right used to be more common is how they kept their ranks up in the past. Mm -hmm. And the, the highborn bloodlines tend to be the more magical, magical ones too. Mm -hmm. And so you have the you know more magical wargs, yeah. more giant umbers, more you know little children of the forest blooded yeah, like the uh, king, re the reeds the running around. King. They were kings that were freed from vassals. Mm -hmm. But they were freed from the Lord. Well, and the, the blood of the first men is the blood <coughs> of the wild things, too. And this is one of the right. I important things we learn in John's journey past the wall. So mm -hmm. uh, the Night's Watch steals wildling children. That's how Mance came That's over to the wall. 
Um, and I think that there's there's an interesting connection there as well, like yeah. everyone is saying with yeah. the magical blood and the first men blood elements. Well, we could go on, but we are at time now. We are past time. So thank you for being such a great and engaged audience.